Okay, we are ready to start, Deborah. Um, Dr. Nassim, I don't seem to be able to enable my video because it says the host has disabled the function. Do you have that there? Um, yeah, can you try now? Yes, it's, it's, you're on. Excellent. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our session for this evening. Depending on where you are in the world, we know that it's either morning time or late evening with you. We have members of the community from the States all the way over to Asia. So thank you very much for coming this evening. I'd like to welcome you all. And I'd also like to um, thank Dr. Nassim for organizing the session. These monthly sessions are proving very, very popular. And even for those that can't make the live sessions, we know that we've had a great response from those that receive the uh, recorded sessions after the live event. Keeping in mind the support of the British Blockchain Association and of our Global Alliance, um, I would like to just kind of highlight um, some good news in relation to our upcoming International Scientific Conference, which is happening on the 14th of March of next year. We've had a record number of academic submissions and we will be announcing all of our speakers for that particular unique um, event in the spring of next year over the coming two or three weeks. Um, that in mind and thinking ahead, we are now in a position to offer members of our community an opportunity to get involved either as speakers or brand sponsors. It's a very, very popular way to raise your company's profile or your organization, get your organization's message across. So I will be sending you an email individually after this particular session with all of the details of the various different sponsorship and uh, speaker opportunities for that particular event. So we welcome you to get involved. It is a very, very unique event. It is a singular event of its kind globally and has built up quite the reputation over time. Our global reputation continues to grow. Um, our membership of our Global Alliance is growing in a very impressive way. And we are absolutely delighted to announce that China and the Chinese blockchain entities have joined the international body that we have put together. And we will be welcoming, welcoming them to our global event meetings over the coming weeks. We look forward to a very busy few weeks ahead. We look forward to completing 2021 and to moving into a very, very vibrant and busy 2022. Please stay in touch. We will be speaking to you again in December and we will be talking a little bit about our spring summer schedule for next year. And again, thank you very much for your support. And we look forward to speaking to you individually about your particip participation in the International Scientific Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah, for um, the um, introduction and the announcements. So, um, Moving on, um, I thought what I would talk today is a little bit about um, uh, the and the um, the opportunities and the challenges that uh, lies ahead, and how blockchain community can play an an important role in this uh, ecosystem. So the work work has moved away from uh, uh, from conference rooms from physical spaces to video calls video games we know uh, are replacing sports uh, as a as a competitive uh, activity and it's it's a fact that we spend most of our uh, daily lives uh, looking at the screens whether it's work or networking or socializing or e-commerce education and and a lot more and no doubt that covid has um, accelerated that um, shift but metaverse takes these interactions to a whole new level you may have seen uh, the announcement from from facebook transitioning to a meta a new name of the company uh, and some of you may have seen and the, the various videos uh, on what a metaverse is and how um, it will change the way we interact 
and function uh, in the coming uh, months and coming years. So what Metaverse does is it takes these interactions to a new level from a two-dimensional experience of looking at the screens. It takes it to a 3D experience uh, where uh, instead of looking at the, the, the screens, we are actually in the place a much more uh, immersive experience. And metaverse is, is much more than just virtual reality uh, or, or crypto or non-fungible tokens um, or avatars or gamings and things. It's essentially a, a concept that ties these ideas together. And it explores the, uh, the way things are interconnected and how they work in collaboration with each other. So while some of us may think that uh, this is something which is further away in the future, uh, Metaverse is actually already here. Here's my daughter. She is only eight years old. And what she's doing here is she's designing a virtual uh, space a virtual uh, play area and the parks in this metaverse. It's called Decentraland. And it's a metaverse space where you can build these, um, these virtual worlds and play games and, and explore uh, various kinds of non-fungible tokens and art museums and, 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 or, and attend live concerts and things using your digital avatars and there are virtual campuses where you can actually go and, and learn stuff. You can socialize with other entities um, and, 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 a, and here she is um, at one of those um, metaverses exploring the events, various games and interacting with people. And this is not something further into the future. This is actually happening right now as we speak. So, so a metaverse is, a, is about three, seven, and nine. That's how I put it. There are three core enablers of metaverse. There are seven key features in a metaverse, and there are nine areas for future research. So, what are the core enablers of metaverse? Now, when we say core enablers means that without them, uh, the metaverse uh, simply could not exist. So these are creators, finance, and technology. So when we talk about creators, we are talking about a very much user-centric, programmable virtual world. Um, it includes coders, it includes developers, programmers, uh, artists, network of individuals, communities, uh, and so on. So these are the these are the the individuals or a group of individuals or networks that uh, bring with them the all the the exciting, uh, stuff that is happening in a metaverse. So they are the creators. And a metaverse is a very much creator and, and user-centric uh, space. The second important enabler is uh, finance. Now, this is slightly different from what we had experienced before. So we had creators, we had the technology, but now we have a fully functioning economy within this metaverse space. And this includes uh, non-fungible tokens. It includes fungible tokens, of course, uh, the cryptos, uh, decentralized finance. You have uh, assets that you can trade, you can buy, you can invest, you can sell uh, via uh, various uh, mechanisms. There is gaming, there is borrowing, there is lending and there is, there is a lot more. So, so finance is another 
essential core enabler uh, in a metaverse. The third essential component, the core enabler, is the tech, is the technology. So we have got some of the essential technologies uh, with us. They are already available, uh, but there may be more in future. We don't know yet. Um, and these are hardwares, first of all. So the, the virtual reality headsets, you may have used these headsets. Uh, some of us already use it in our day-to-day -day interactions. And, um, and Facebook has been selling those uh, virtual reality headsets for, for quite some time now. And, and then we have the software, the, the underlying software infrastructure, uh, blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence, smart contracts, side chains, and so on. So these are the three core enablers of a metaverse, creators, finance, and technology. Now, what are the key features of an open metaverse? This is a slide which has been uh, designed by the Center for Evidence-Based Blockchain. And I really like this slide because it really sums up what is an open metaverse. And when we talk about open metaverse means a metaverse where um, uh, which is not uh, controlled by a single entity, uh, and it's really there is uh, there is censorship resistance. It's open, um, and then there are some other key features. So the first one is that it is live and persistent. It's real time. There are no recorded sessions there in metaverse. When you when you log in, when you go in, there are things happening real time, live whether it's a music concert or somebody selling an NFT or you are joining an art gallery or meeting people, it's very much live. It's concurrent and convergent, which means that the things are operating at the same time. So at the same time in a metaverse, somebody is, uh, is selling their NFT art, somebody is playing a game, somebody is uh, constructing and building um, uh, and making designs. So it's, it's all happening at the same time. It, it never goes off. It's always live. It's 24 seven. The other essential feature, which I think it's a slightly harder problem to solve, but uh, it, that's the ambition that there are no cap on the users. And what it means is that at one time, there is no limit on how many people can actually be a part of that uh, uh, metaverse. Right now, if you look at the, the various video games, there is a cap on the number of users. Usually it's 100 or 200 and not, not more than uh, the, that number can actually join and participate. Same applies to even our 2D interactions. There is a cap on how many people can join a Zoom call or, 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 or other um, virtual interactions. But the, the vision, the ambition, the idea is that a metaverse will have no cap on the a number of users. Another essential feature is that uh, Metaverse will have a fully functioning user-centric economy. Um, of course, you will be joining and exiting the economy at, uh, at your will uh, by, um, by taking your, um, your assets or your reputation or your avatars or rewards or whatever it is to other Metaverses. Uh, if something you have earned in a metaverse, uh, whether it's a non-fungible token or a fungible token uh, or, or, or any kind of award or royalty point, you should be able to uh, take it outside of that metaverse and, and, uh, and use it uh, elsewhere. Otherwise, it will become a very much a centralized system where you have um, everything tied in in, 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 one, in one platform or one uh, metaverse. So, an open metaverse has to be interoperable, both in terms of uh, the interoperability from software pers the perspective, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's blockchain, the two blockchains talking to each other, the side chains, as well as the what's happening in the system itself uh, in terms of your assets, rewards, uh, et cetera. And another important feature is that an open metaverse would be uh, open, so open source and open code and uh, programmable and, uh, and censorship resistant. 
and you should be able to, to log in uh, using your uh, a decentralized form of, uh, of ID. So these are the, these are the uh, seven key features of a, an open metaverse ecosystem. Now, obviously we are, we are very early. We are very, very early at this stage and uh, nobody really knows which direction is going to go. It's here already, it's happening, uh, but we do not have uh, the answers to all the, the, all the questions at this stage. And obviously we have lots of questions. So I think it's important to always keep asking better questions uh, rather than um, having all the answers ready because we don't have them at this stage. So I think the, 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 most, uh, the most important nine uh, areas for future research are uh, number one, what is going to be the uh, societal impact of metaverse on us, on our future generations. Then what are the ethical issues? And there are, there are obviously there are many uh, issues around privacy, uh, security, reputation, um, ID theft, and there are many more. So, so what are the ethical issues? I think we need to do some research on it. We are still very early. The next, then the next important area for future research is how do we build sustainable uh, systems? Uh, we, there are concerns, as we all know, about um, energy consumption of blockchains, uh, of tokens. So how do we build sustainable systems in a metaverse? Another important consideration is uh, is open versus closed systems. So, uh, so Facebook Meta versus uh, fully open, decentralized, autonomous organizations and their uh, infrastructures. Obviously, there will be trade-offs uh, with pros and cons. So, uh, it's important to again look into the open versus closed systems uh, comparisons uh, and the pros and cons and try to establish uh, uh, the, uh, the various uh, facts uh, and, and get some data around it. Training and education of stakeholders, I think is another one. Um, we might be moving too fast. We might be moving too slow, we don't know. But from a stakeholders perspective, I think it's important that if we say to a university, look, we have a metaverse and this is how it works. So let's start educating students in a metaverse. I think it is easier said than done. Uh, university is going to ask, well, what is in it for us? What is in it for stakeholders? What are the various incentive mechanisms for us to adopt this uh, for the adoption of metaverse? So I think uh, a stakeholder participation, a stakeholder education, and a stakeholder incentive mechanisms is in is an important consideration. And finally, will this metaverse make our lives better? Is it going to make the world a better place to live? I think this is an extremely important question um, and it is worth exploring the possibilities. And I've said this before in, in my LinkedIn post as well, that the future uh, looks very exciting but it's important to uh, keep on asking better questions and, uh, and keep on refining the systems and, and how they work. And at the end of the day, are they making our lives better? So that's, uh, I think, is the most important consideration. So uh, that's it from me. Um, I'll move on and um, would like to invite uh, Professor Yuthas uh, to give us a talk, uh, a brief talk on uh, enterprise blockchain and, and consortiums. So Professor Yuthas is a uh, professor um, uh, uh, at Portland State University. She has presented papers at our scientific conferences. She has published her um, research uh, papers in the JBBA. And this is one of her, uh, the slide from uh, ISC, International Scientific Conference earlier this year when she presented her paper on 
strategic value creation in enterprise blockchains. So I would like to uh, invite uh, Professor Yutas to give us uh, an overview of uh, uh, enterprise blockchain consortiums and how value is created. And I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, talk. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Nassim, could you, I, I'm not allowed to share my screen yet. You should be able to share a screen now, I think. Great. There, I'm, I'm not allowed to turn on my video either, but I'll turn that on after. Um, so yes, so as Dr. Uh, Nakvi said, this paper was published in the JBBA. And so most of what I'm gonna be talking about today will be there in that paper. And so if you want some more detail, you can find it there. So I am the, I'm an accounting professor at Portland State University in Oregon in the US. And um, we have a blockchain certificate program there. It's six university courses. And we're now in our third year of that program. Um, so we think a lot about these issues. We're in a business school. We think a lot about strategy. Um, as we're working in addition to the technology. So these co-authors of mine, Yolanda Saracen and, and Asad Aziz are at the University of Colorado, or at Colorado State University. So when we started thinking about this, one of the concerns that I've had for a long time is wondering, you know, why aren't organizations adopting enterprise blockchain systems. And there's been a lot of work about barriers to adoption. Um, really the value proposition that we hear all the time about what blockchain systems can do for enterprises is they can address pain points um, and they can reduce friction. So pain points for a business might be something like the difficulties in reconciling invoices with customers. And so at any time, an, enterprise might have millions of dollars of outstanding invoices that are in dispute with customers, large, large organizations. And so these are pain points. And so it might be worth it to join a blockchain to solve pain points like that. And then reduce friction. Similarly, um, you can reduce that kind of friction. You can remove middlemen and all those kind of things that we hear about regularly. So, but the question for individual firms thinking about whether to create or join an enterprise blockchain consortium is whether joining that consortium is really worth the investment. Is it really worth it to get rid of those pain points when I have such a huge investment, especially the first time I join a blockchain? So the firm must have certain capabilities or develop such capabilities so they need to be able to manage the technology and integrating the blockchain within their own ERP systems, um, et cetera. They must have the appropriate personnel who can understand blockchain and they must educate everyone else who will be dealing with these new systems. And then of course, there are legal and compliance risks um, and problems to address. There's a lot of regulatory uncertainty as we know. And so all of that makes it very expensive for a company to invest in a new blockchain system. In addition to the individual firm capabilities, they must have the capabilities to um, participate effectively in a consortium, which of course means that all the consortium members must share a vision and strategy about what this consortium is going to do. And then they must have expertise in governance and management of the consortium so that every member um, can contribute and every member has some return on their investment in that consortium. And those are incredibly difficult to manage. And so <clears throat> for most firms still, they believe, you know, no, it's really not worth the investment. You know, I'll just deal with these pain points and friction because it's just too expensive to do anything else. Oops. There we go. 
So what we believe though, is that these enterprises are getting the return on investment calculations wrong because what they're doing is really focusing on operational impacts, the pain points, the frictions, the disintermediation, the costs reduction, and they're forgetting about including the strategic impacts in part because that just has not been discussed very much. And so in our paper, we talked about a lot about the strategic alliance literature. There's a huge body of literature and strategy about alliances. And so consortia can learn from um, the experiences of these alliances. And then the resource-based view of the firm is a theory about how firms gain competitive advantage. Basically, it's because they have capabilities that cannot be copied um, or imitated effectively. And so when you're sharing, so when you're when we're in this sort of co-op co-opetition of a consortium, it's very different than the way we typically think about strategy. And so it's difficult for firms to move into that new paradigm. So what we tried to do in the paper is kind of outline a lot of the ways that firms can get strategic benefits on top of any operational benefits so that they can see that for now and in the future, investing in a blockchain consortium and enterprise blockchain might be worthwhile. <clears throat> so there's three basic sources of competitive advantage. So the first firms that join a consortium can build upon their existing strategy. They can just strengthen the strategy that they already have they can share complementary resources with their blockchain partners, and they can build blockchain specific capabilities that can serve them well in the future as blockchains become more prevalent. So I'll go through each one of these. Okay, so they can build on their existing strategy in um, these three ways. First, they can strengthen their own value proposition. So if their value proposition has anything to do with provenance, um, you know, they're an organic vegetable firm or they're a diamond firm that says they're not doing conflict diamonds, then that provenance can strengthen the value proposition that they're already claiming. Um, they can also expand network reach. So they can reach a broader network of trading partners. So for example, there's a real estate firm, a multiple listing firm that can access more clients, more properties because they're doing things on the blockchain. And then in addition, they can gain access to new markets. So for example, um, in Madrid, there's a blockchain, um, an enterprise blockchain in the works where you can buy a single ticket that will get you on the train, on the on a motorcycle on a bike. So you can just buy one ticket and rent all the, the pieces that you need to get you to your destination. And so for motorcycle and bike rentals, that expands the market to people that may not have taken advantage of those sorts of transportation options prior to joining the blockchain. Then the second source of competitive advantage is that firms can share complementary resources. So first they can leverage their partner's resources. So the Port of Rotterdam, for example, so they, they get information about um, the movement of the ships in and out. And so they know who's coming and when. So that allows them to better manage their port space so they can have the cranes ready, customs ready, and everything ready for when the ship arrives. So it's, it's um, effective for both all parties to share those resources in that way. Second, they can gain access to data. So an example of that is um, maritime insurance. And so if we know where the ships are moving and how goods are being transported from place to place, we can create specific insurance products that will follow along with those goods and can accommodate changes in weather and changes in routes and all those kinds of things. Third, we can share risk. And so um, MetaLedger is a good example of that. In the US, there's legislation that says for opioid um, pharmaceuticals, you have to trace them all the way to the distributor. And if they're returned, you've got to trace them all the way back. And so pharmaceutical companies have grouped together to share the risk of managing those opioid um, deliveries and, and returns so that they can all participate in this blockchain. 
And then finally, um, strengthening relationships. So there's just many examples of firms that join a consortium blockchain, get to form relationships with the other members of that consortium, and then go off to form strategic alliances with individual partners in the consortium outside of the blockchain environment. Okay, and then finally, companies, of course, by participating in the first blockchain, they will start building blockchain specific capabilities that can serve them well in the future. So smart contract expertise. So a simple example of this might be, you know, you might have a smart contracts to buy NFTs. And then as you gain more expertise, you might realize, oh, well, we can, um, we can manage royalties so that when the NFT continues to get sold down the line, we can um, return some of those royalties back to the original producer of that NFT. Um, but it takes some time to gain that experience. And so when companies get started and they start with simple smart contracts, then over time they can get more sophisticated, which will open up new strategic opportunities. And the same is true with use cases. So for example, um, Henkel's, Henkel uh, Consumer Goods the uh, company has experimented with all kinds of blockchain, but their experience in use cases associated with consumer goods has given them the expertise so that they can um, participate in other kinds of blockchains. For example, they participate in Plastic Bank, which is a you know, plastic recycling blockchain. And they can do that because they already understood um, blockchains and what they can do. And so it's easy for them to then join in other uh, blockchain consortia that might be strategically beneficial. Um, yeah, same with consortium participation. So they learn how governance works. They learn how to create ROI through their participation, and then they can carry that over to new blockchains that they participate in. And then finally, um, they can develop relationships with the consortium partners that enable them to develop new blockchain uh, collaborations with those same partners. Okay, and so uh, through all of that, they can also develop readiness for, um, you know, when CBDCs come along, our new NFTs, the metaverse options, regulatory changes, because they've, they're already as far ahead of other organizations that have not participated in blockchain at all yet. And then this is not in the paper, but because the, this paper looks at it from an individual firm perspective and that individual firm strategy when they're making a decision of whether to join a consortium or not. But um, let me get back here. But um, there are also sort of platform level opportunities. So when we think about the metaverse, that might be a good way to think about this. So for the, the ecosystem itself, for the consortium itself, there may be opportunities for innovation that can then carry back and have strategic benefits for the individual firms involved. So for example, in the metaverse, there might be joint marketing opportunities. Um, there's, a, there's some metaverses where you can own land like Decentraland or the ones like that. So, if you're on the same block with other firms, you could, for example, spiff up your block and do have joint advertising in that block. Um, same with joint products and services at the ecosystem level, you could have shopping malls that include all these participants that otherwise wouldn't be, wouldn't be collaborating in, uh, in real life. And then finally, new business models. So for example, <laughs> I heard about a, a metaverse dating app. So you can actually date in the metaverse, the avatars dating each other. <laughs> so there's all kinds of opportunities and those, those things that were just on the beginning of thinking about all this, but if you just stay away from blockchain to begin with, you're so far behind everyone else who's already putting their toe in the water here. Okay, and so here's the, here's the name and the, um, the link here for that article I can, drop that into the chat. And then I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Christy. Excellent talk. Um, so there is a there are a couple of questions. Um, 
there is one is is it tech or collaboration what's the bigger challenge for enterprises i think what they're asking is is it that the tech expertise smart contracts and the technical side of things the technology or is it the to build alliances and consortiums in in your research what did you find this was a bigger challenge um well you know i'm a little biased because i'm on the business side but to me the the concern the collaborating and the governance those are far bigger issues than the tech the tech has moved so far beyond where businesses are tech innovation is going so fast and we're solving problems so quickly and there's so many good people moving into the tech space and then we're just i feel like we're just decades behind on the business side we just can't keep up you know we're very resistant to change in a lot of ways it's risky and we don't have the regulatory you know i mean just to, to change erp systems in one individual organization just to switch over from oracle to sap or something that is a huge process and it requires collaboration between many divisions within a business it's really hard to make a single change like that mm. so when you have collaboration between 10 different organizations and they're all trying to get legal on board and marketing and operations and tech you know it's just these are big difficult projects from a from the business side from an operation side yeah indeed yeah. and there's another question are we creating a parallel online society in in ways yeah i think i think we are um uh, as i said before i think we there is still it's a long way to go still still very early um there will be it's not going to be i think a single metaverse i think there there, there are going to be many many metaverses and companies and and yes we are in a way creating a parallel online society um a digital parallel society christy any thoughts uh christy we can't hear you sorry i think your mic mic is on mute Oops, sorry about that yeah so yeah. yeah we can hear you now yeah yeah definitely these are parallel universes um i've just been going back because i'm still fascinated by the metaverse as you are um, so i've just mm -hmm. been going back and reading like snow crash that was the first book where the term metaverse was used and watching these ready player one and things like that i mean people have been thinking about these alternative realities for so long and i think like the example with your daughter i mean they really live they really think like that you know they build things they invite friends to join them in their little worlds that they create they play together there you know they they buy clothes and items i mean they're already living in that separate world you know it's it's hard for us i think we didn't grow up with any of that it's hard for us to understand why you would want to do that but you know in some of those in that snow crash um, book which i think was in the early 90s you know people were you know they had rough lives they were poor they were living in you know rough conditions and so they'd all have to just put on their virtual headset they could go into their very fancy house and watch tv on a great big huge big screen and you know they could sip their beer in real life while they're doing all that but you know it just takes them out of an environment that's really difficult and puts them in an environment that's really joyful for them so you know it's understandable how this could happen we you know i, I think we have a sort of an ethical aversion to living that way. You know, we want to talk to people in real life. <laughs> and I see my kid, my own kids, you know, online way too much and it, you know, it upsets me, but you know, maybe I'm just yeah, definitely it's a whole different way of thinking and living and and they get a lot of joy out of it. I hear them up there laughing and you know, shouting to each other. I mean, you know, they're in it. They're really involved in what they're doing. So yeah, it is. It is addictive. I've tried that. <laughs> um there's one question from from carlos can a blockchain consortium be adopted for example by the international organization of supreme audit institutions with the aim of creating an international hyper transparent uh, environment transparency in consortiums yeah that is that is such a good question because the international um accounting boards have worked to create international accounting standards and auditing standards and so 
you know, it would be fantastic. It changes auditing so much when you can trust, you know, you can trust the transactions that you're auditing. So there's so many huge changes coming about and it would be so much better if we could do this on an international scale, you know, the bigger businesses that are being audited by the bigger firms are international anyway. And so, um, you know, that could just, it could, it would be great. I'm sure it would be really slow and it just involves so many people, but I would say that is going to come at some point just because it's so efficient. Yeah. Are there, are there any papers, Christy, on ethics of these consortiums and how people operate and how people behave and interact and the ethical side of these partnerships? Um, you know, from my experience, I find it so hard to find detailed information about what's happening inside the consortia. Yeah. I, I know that there's, you know, like with the NERS consortium, there were all kinds of problems at the beginning and they felt like NERS was too much in control or IBM and nobody would join. There's all kinds of stuff, you know, there's a little bit like, there's some good detail about that one consortium, but it's so hard to understand what's really going on. So definitely there are all kinds of, I'm sure there are all kinds of disagreements and difficulties trying to, it's very hard to balance, you know, who's, who benefits and who pays in these consortia. And exactly. especially when some, some of the organizations are so far ahead, they can see how to benefit from this shared data, for example, where other organizations can't. And so, you know, it's very hard to keep things in balance. So yeah, there's definitely ethical issues, but I can't, I can't name any specific papers that go into that kind of detail because I just think it's so hard to get them. Exactly, indeed. No, thank you very much, uh, Christy, for your time. And it was excellent talk, excellent questions. Um, we move on to um, our next speaker, uh, Professor Eric Vermeulen, who uh, couldn't make it today. Um, because he had some personal, uh, but he sent us this uh, a recorded message. So I'm just going to play here. Hi, Bye. everyone. Hi, everyone. Unfortunately, I cannot be with you in the virtual live session today. I have to go to the vet with my dog, who since yesterday doesn't feel that well. And because it's Sunday and there wasn't another time slot available. So I'm very sorry for that. But the good news is that the organizers of this event asked me to record a five minute video. And yes, I can do that. So here's the video. So the title of this video of this presentation may sound surprising to, I think most of you, why businesses need blockchain savvy lawyers. Well, I am both a professor at Tilburg University and an in-house lawyer at a company called Signify. And I bet you that you all know Signify. Signify was formerly known as Philips Lighting, you know, the company of the light bulbs. And Philips, the radio, is the electronics company. And because of my practical experience for almost 25 years in this company, uh, but I can tell you the last three years have been like a roller coaster, I'm convinced that we need more blockchain savvy lawyers. One of the reasons why I have included a coding for lawyers course in my program at the university. Not because I think all the lawyers should become coders, no. But lawyers should be able to work closely together with coders. So what's going on? Why do we need these blockchain savvy lawyers? Well, we are witnessing the end of the corporation as we know it. The hierarchical structure with all its management layers and processes and procedures doesn't work anymore and is slowly but surely be replaced by a flatter, call it more decentralized structure, a platform, an ecosystem. Consider these light bulbs. The two light bulbs on the left hand side are conventional lamps. They give light and the modern version that you can see in the middle, uh, well, lasts for approximately three years. The one on the far left that was the first lamp, the first Philips lamp that was manufactured in 1891. But then for I think 100 years, nothing really changed. But then you see the light bulb on the right hand side. It's an LED light. And this light bulb will last for more than 10 years. But the most interesting thing is that it's much smarter. It forms the basis for an IoT platform. It's about connectivity, big data, light as a service, as you can see on this slide. 
we can do so many things with this light bulb now. It can be connected to other things, other devices. Uh, it can gather data. With this data, it becomes much smarter. And it can offer so many more services than just light. And to reach the, let's say, uh, full potential of this light bulb, the light bulb also needs a different organizational structure. As already mentioned, a flatter structure that's closer to the consumer and other organizations. In short, we need a platform ecosystem. And in these structures, blockchain technology and smart contracts will play a crucial role. In IoT platforms, things like cars, buildings, light bulbs will not only be connected and interact with each other, they will also transact. And to make sure that these transactions work, we need legal engineers. People understand how lawyers think, but also understand how the digital age works. Number two, an ecosystem needs vibrant and loyal communities, as you can see on this slide. And I think we all know that non-fungible tokens, NFTs, will play a crucial role in this community building. And finally, decentralized autonomous organizations will become a competitive advantage, as Mark Cuban already predicted a while ago, as you can see on this slide. So businesses that understand DAOs and can use these DAOs as a business tool will have a competitive advantage. So businesses don't only need traditional lawyers that you can see here on this slide. They also need a new type of lawyer. Let's call them digital lawyers. Lawyers who can work together with blockchain experts and coders. And I think if businesses understand that, and attract these new type of lawyers, they will definitely remain relevant and be successful in the future. So thank you very much for making it until the end of this video. It's exactly a five minutes video. Um, hopefully uh, we will see each other in the future, either virtually or in person. Again, thank you so much. And if you want to connect with me, here's how to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Eric, for this uh, video. It's fascinating, Eric, uh, fantastic guy. He's um, uh, one of our senior editors, uh, also at the JBBA. Um, Kolea from Canada couldn't make it because of uh, some um, personal uh, issues. So uh, I'd like to apologize for that. Um, right, so what we do uh, at the end of these sessions is we uh, pick one of the winners for our complimentary ticket to the ISC 2022. And um, I've just been told that today's winner is Carlos Arojo. Al Carlos Alberto Arojo. Carlos, are you here? Yes, I think you are. Carlos, um, we don't know you. Um, please, can you drop uh, an email to BBA? or um, be BB admin so we can get in touch with you and you will get your complimentary pass uh, sometime in January. So congratulations again. And um, Carlos, where are you from? Are you still here? If you just type in the chat, which country? Angola, right, okay, very good. So congratulations. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and this, this um, session was very ins insightful. I personally learned a lot. The recording would be available on our YouTube channel uh, next week, hopefully. And uh, thank you to our speakers, uh, Deborah, Christy, uh, Eric, everybody who joined in. Y these are uh, CPD sessions. So all the participants will get a CPD certificate of attendance from the BBA. Uh, uh, and um, you uh, can use it for your personal portfolio and, um, and your, your profile. So it's one hour of CPD. Thank you very much all joining and uh, we'll see you again, uh, hopefully next month and um, all the best uh, and uh, have, a, have a great uh, week ahead. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks so much for hosting. These are so interesting. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank